Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Marco DiGirolamo. I am the New York State Program Manager for Senior Planet and Older Adult Technology Services. I want to thank you all for attending today's webinar, which is in collaboration with the News Literacy Project. Today's webinar is one of three webinars that are being hosted. The first one was offered back in January. We'll have the one today, and then there will be another one following in March, which you will be receiving information about in the coming weeks. Um, I have muted everybody. Um, we do ask that you please remain muted unless um, you are called on to um, ask any questions. Throughout the um, program, there will be certain points in time where you can ask questions. We do ask, just because there is an ample group of you here today, that you um, put any questions you have in the chat and be respectful of everybody's questions and um, not interrupt as people are talking. So um, now I will um, leave it to John Silva, who is from the News Literacy Project, and he will be providing today's Exploring the Misinformation Landscape webinar. Um, great, thank you so much. Um, and good afternoon from Chicago, uh, where we are fortunately finally starting to uh, emerge from our deep snow. Uh, we're going to be talking about misinformation today. Um, and as, as mentioned, this is the second in our series. Um, so if you happen to have attended the first one, a couple of the concepts will be familiar. Uh, but this is this builds on uh, the previous session. So my name is John Silva. I am part of the education team at the News Literacy Project. Uh, my primary responsibility is about prof uh, doing professional development for educators. Um, but also events like this, talking about news literacy topics um, to adults in the, in the general public. Um, I do spend a lot of my time researching misinformation and also in particular conspiracy theories, um, understanding you know, why people believe them, how they spread on, uh, especially on social media, um, and how we can develop education programs to try to fight it. Um, I've been with the News Literacy Project for just about four years. Um, prior to that, I was a classroom teacher in Chicago Public Schools, um, teaching middle and high school uh, social studies. Um, if you'd like to reach out to me um, after today's session, if you have uh, questions you'd like to follow up, my email address is there on the lower left of the screen. Um, and if you happen to be active on Twitter, um, that is my Twitter handle where I do share a lot of things related to what we're going to talk about today. Um, also, um, you will see in here, um, a couple of my colleagues have also joined in particular, um, my wonderful colleague, Miriam Romais, who works with me in professional development. She is going to be dropping links and kind, kind of helping to answer some questions in the chat. Um, so, you know, please, uh, you know, make sure you say hello to Miriam. She's going to be helping out sort of as I'm, as I'm talking. Um, so I am from the News Literacy Project. We are a just about 13 year old national nonpartisan nonprofit organization. Our, our primary focus is about um, embedding news literacy in the American education experience. We want to provide resources and professional development and curriculum um, and everything that we can to support educators in bringing news literacy into their classrooms. Um, so because we do believe and we advocate that news literacy is absolutely a critical skill, um, especially in the 21st century. Um, and it's one that we all need to be learning and relearning and practicing. Um, because as we have seen, especially in the last several years, um, people are starting to have arguments about whether or not facts are real. And, you know, uh, several years ago, the term alternative facts was, was going around. And we're, we're not able to sort of have common conversations about things because it's because it, there is so much created gray areas. And so we wanna emphasize the importance of facts and verified information. Um, and we also advocate for the importance of being informed from, from a you know, reputable news organizations and journalists um, and the, the, the freedom we have from, especially from the first amendment. Um, if you'd like to connect with the News Literacy Project on social media, um, you, can, you can reach out to us. Uh, we are very active on social media. I'll also share a link to our website in a little bit. Um, so today's conversation is about misinformation, um, understanding what it is, um, understanding how and why it spreads, 
Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we push back against it um, when we encounter it. Um, so the first thing I, I wanna do is we wanna define what misinformation is and what the different types are. So one of the first challenges when we start talking about this is that we too often call anything that's false fake news. Um, and fake news has become a very problematic term in a lot of ways, especially because it's been weaponized and politicized. Um, and it's fake news is used as this dismissive or divisive term that's more accurately like, I don't agree with that, I don't like that. And it actually is often used regardless of whether or not something is, has been verified or is credible. The reality is, is that misinformation takes a lot of different forms. It's, I'm gonna show you what these different forms are. Um, and the other challenge that we're, we're struggling with is that a lot of us are feeling overwhelmed that we feel like there's so much false information out there that we don't quite know what to trust anymore. And we feel ourselves giving in to cynicism that we can't trust anything because there's so much fake stuff out there. The thing that we wanna understand is that that's what misinformation is designed to do. Misinformation overwhelms us. It, it confuses us, it manipulates our emotions and it makes us not trust anything. So hopefully, by having a better understanding of the field of misinformation and, and the forms that it takes and whatnot, we will feel maybe a little less overwhelmed and we may feel more comfortable being critical as opposed to cynical. Um, an important distinction that I wanna mention right off the top here is the difference between misinformation and disinformation. Um, a lot of people conflate these terms and use them interchangeably when they're actually very different. Misinformation is a very broad term that applies to pretty much anything that is, fa anything that is false, anything that is, that is meant to be misleading. Um, and it's actually, it's, it's a term that's, that is sort of disconnected from intent. The intent behind it is actually not important. It, it's really about it being false or misleading. Disinformation is something that is false or misleading um, that was created with the intent of spreading false information for, for misleading people. Um, and it was shared with this deliberate intention to deceive. So disinformation is a, is, is a, is a specific type of misinformation. Um, so I just wanna make sure we understand that because I'm gonna be talking about the broader field of misinformation. Um, so when we talk about misinformation, if we wanna stop using the term fake news, we have to learn how to be more specific. And so what we have done is we have, de we have defined five different types of misinformation. And what we were trying to do is to define a way that we could objectively define a type of misinformation that is separate from intent. And I'm gonna show you some examples of these. One of the most common types of misinformation, especially on social media is manipulated content. So in this example, you see here, this is a, this is a photograph of several members of Congress and you can see on their clothing that uh, someone has used photo editing tools to put um, a combination of uh, these yellow stars in the shape of a swastika on their clothing. Um, so this is, this, this is, someone photoshopped this to try to insinuate that they are using the star from the, the uh, communist Chinese flag, but also the swastika. So manipulated content you have, is when you have something that is originally you know, a real image, but one aspect of it has been changed to create a false information. So they were not wearing these, that design was not originally on them. So that, so it's been manipulated. Um, another very common type of misinformation is called false context. Um, so this image has actually been around since uh, about 2014 or 2015. Um, and so um, this is, was originally a yacht uh, that was covered in uh, ice. I uh, have not been able to find the original context of where this image was taken, um, but somebody has taken it and they've labeled it, this is the USS Al Gore Global Re Warming Research Vessel. Um, so it's, they took an original image and they changed its context uh, to create a type of misinformation. So taking something out of context, changing its, its meaning, changing the caption is a very common type of misinformation. Um, Another one that we see a lot still is what we call fabricated content. This is where something is, the entire thing has been made up. 
um, a lot of what we used to call fake news, which is completely fake news stories that were made up to look like real news stories to deceive us into clicking on it. We also call that clickbait. That's that's fabricated content. So this is a this is a website that that makes up these fake articles. Um, for some reason, Malia Obama being arrested for various things is, is a common theme with some of these websites. So it's completely fabricated. The entire thing is made up. Um, you may have seen this tweet uh, recently if you're active on social media um, with the, 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 the difficult weather they've been having down in Texas. Um, this fake tweet started going around from claiming to be from Senator Ted Cruz. Um, this is a fake tweet. This was something that was created using a program. It was designed to look like a real tweet, um, but it's what we call imposter content. So the difference between a fake tweet and fabricated content like this is that it's trying to use a well-known name or like an, an, uh, a, a politician, a famous person, maybe a brand like a corporation. So it's trying to make you believe that it's real because it has this, this person's name. So Senator Cruz never tweeted this, right? It, it, there's, this, is, this was completely, this was completely made up, but it made, it's made to look like it's from his real account. So that's what we call imposter content. Um, the last one um, is a little tricky because we don't often think of satire as misinformation, right? Because satire is usually meant to be humorous. Uh, a lot of times it, it is, it's somewhat political, right? It's using comedy to make, uh, you know, and, and hyperbole to make political commentary sometimes. Um, but this, uh, so this woman, Blair Erskine, she's a comedian and she created this video um, making it as if she was the director of communications for Senator Cruz. Um, and if you, if you had watched it, it was, it was meant to sort of be this over the top, trying to excuse uh, the Senator's trip to Cancun. Um, but the, what's challenging is that if you look at her account, she clearly says it's it's comedy. She, she doesn't try. She's not pretending to be someone she's not. The problem is, is that too many people see this, and it aligns with a political belief, and they believe it. They believe it to be true, and then they share it as if it's true. So this this video, when I took the screenshot, it had been liked sixty six thousand times. It had been retweeted twelve thousand times almost 11,000 quote retweets, this went viral. The thousands and thousands of people saw this and many of them thought it was real. And so the challenge with satire is that sometimes when it hits a belief that we have, we don't recognize it as satire and we've been manipulated into believing that it's true. Um, so I'll just pause really quick uh, to see if there's some questions about the five types. Um, I'll just, I'll take a quick look at the chat. I can see that uh, Miriam has put a couple of things in. Uh, I see Jim is back. Uh, good to see you again, Jim. Um, we'll take a look at that a bit later. I'll see. I'll take a look at that comment a bit later. Let's see if there's any new. Okay. Um, all right. So those are the types, right? So we can we can define these different types of misinformation. So why do people create them? Why do people share them? So this is one of this is where we really get into understanding the behavior, um, because a lot of this is about human behavior. Um, so one of the things that's tricky um, is that we have to, when we talk about motivations, we have to try to get to intent. Um, but intent is very difficult in most cases to be able to have a, a way of identifying it objectively, because. When we talk about misinformation, the intent behind the person who created the misinformation and then the intentions behind the people who shared it can be very, very different. Um, but trying to get to intent can help us understand the, what its purpose is, what type it is. The intent is also tied to our emotions, which I'll talk about in just a minute. But trying to ask about the intent, trying to get to it and trying to talk about it can help us understand misinformation um, a little bit better. So part of it is what are the different sort of type, you know, types of intent. So uh, when we look at some misinformation for people who create it, some people are creating misinformation for the purposes of making money. We see this with the what we call the, you know, the old fake news websites, the clickbait. People create this content 
so that people will click on it. And every time you click on it, it generates some ad revenue, right? So there is a financial incentive in some cases for misinformation. Some people do it just because they can, because they want to get a reaction out of people. They want to make people angry. They want to generate outrage. They want to make people laugh, perhaps. So some people are doing it just because they want to get a reaction. The much more problematic aspects of this, though, are when misinformation is used as a weapon. Um, misinformation is used in, in hyperpartisan politics, uh, sharing misinformation, trying to discredit an opponent, um, trying to create uh, partisan uh, infighting. We see it a lot. We see a lot of misinformation being used in politics. Much more problematically, and we saw this in particular in the 2016 election, we saw it also to a lesser extent, but it was still there in the 2020 election, is that misinformation is being used to try to make us not trust our own democratic processes. You know, in, in the 2020 election, we saw so much misinformation about election security and whether or not um, there had been rampant voter fraud. And, you know, there was all this, there was so much misinformation in that field that people were questioning whether or not you know, it was a safe, secure election, but when all the evidence points to it being one of the most reliable elections we've ever had, but the misinformation created so much distrust and made us and made so many, many of us question things that we, we started to believe that maybe we didn't quite know what was going on. Um, and then when we talk about why people share it, and so the people who share it and spread it, um, there's different motivations behind why people can, why people share it, why people create it. Um, so some of it is self-interest. People are looking out for themselves. Uh, some of it is about making money. It's about, it's about spreading a, a, you know, a certain in individual viewpoint. We see the group interest with, with a lot of hyper-partisan groups, government agencies, uh, political candidates, but some people actually share it um, because they, they believe something to be true and they believe it should be shared. So there, there is sometimes a sense of altruism in how misinformation spreads. But the really problematic stuff though is the malicious intent, the people who are doing it, who are trolls, who are trying to get that angry reaction, the political extremists, and, in, and also on the extreme cases, uh, people who are spreading dangerous conspiracy theories. So I'm gonna to try to show you some examples of this to highlight it. Um, it's not always so easy to, to categorize them because sometimes it may appear to be you know, more than one intent, but I'm gonna just try to illustrate it. So here's an example of self-interest. This is an Instagram post from a, uh, a man who runs a natural health practice um, he is spreading uh, misinformation here in particular about the effectiveness of masks. Um, if you were to look at some of the things that he shares on his website, the social media, you know, he believes that, um, you know, COVID-19 is, is not as dangerous as it is. In some cases, it's a hoax, but he's also pushing a lot of his natural remedies um, and sort of things that are designed to uh, cure illnesses without using actual medical science. So he's He's, he's spreading this misinformation to sort of promote himself as this natural healing uh, sort of practitioner. Um, this is an example of group interest. This is a, an Instagram account from a, uh, a group that is an anti-vaccine moms group. So they are very active in spreading um, misinformation relating to vaccines. Um, and even spreading some anti-vaccine conspiracy theories. And in here in this case, uh, they're spreading this false claim that somehow Ticketmaster is going to require that you have identification proving that you've gotten the COVID vaccine before you can go to a concert. Uh, it's completely false, but they're, they're spreading this because it's part of their, their group's uh, beliefs about anti-vaccines uh, conspiracy theories. Um, here's an example of, of one that was altruistic. So this was actually, um, it started back in April um, in the early, sort of the early weeks of the pandemic, um, back when people were having a hard time finding masks, uh, if you can remember that time. And so this, this hoax uh, went viral on social media for several weeks in April, claiming that if you uh, put your mask in a Ziploc bag and you put it in a microwave, it'll sanitize your, it'll sanitize your, your mask. And you can see that this, this screenshot here had been shared over 18,000 times. So this is, this is an example of you know, this rumor going viral. But the reality is that 
um, you absolutely should not uh, microwave your mask. Um, and so it, it, this went so viral, people were doing it and it was actually causing fires and several fire agencies around the country had to put out these notices saying, please don't microwave your mask. But you can sort of get it, you can see the sort of sense that like this person is trying to share what she thinks is, you know, credible advice, um, something that she thinks people need to know. And so she, she, she's not sharing it because she's trying to cause, she's probably not trying to get people to cause her microwaves on fire. So you can sort of get a sense of that. Um, and then this is an example of one that is, is a very malicious form of misinformation. It's using imagery from the Holocaust, um, claiming that, you know, we're going to be microchipped um, and, and, and sort of tapping into some of the deepest, darkest reactions that you can have, especially, you know, when you use imagery like this, this is, this is malicious intent, right? This person is trying to, to suggest that like something horrific is going to happen if you, if you get the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, so one of the things that is, is, is constant through misinformation is about our emotions um, and the fact that uh, misinformation is using our emotions against us, right? Because what misinformation wants us to do, right? It wants us to have an emotional reaction. The stronger the reaction, the better, because what happens is that in that emotional reaction, um, the, the emotion parts of our brains are overriding the rational parts of our brains. And instead of thinking about it, we're reacting. And that reaction on social media is often hitting that like, the retweet, the share button. And we are helping to spread it because we're reacting to it before we can think about it. And the reality is, is that we are all vulnerable to having our emotions manipulated. It's actually very easy in a lot of cases. And any emotion can actually be used against us. Um, so one of the things that we, you know, we see a lot of the misinformation deals in anger and fear, but there are also other emotions can be used. People believe something is true because they, because they found it to be really, really funny and they share it like satire. Um, sometimes it's about curiosity. Sometimes it's about uh, hopefulness. We see that with things like scams. Um, they're designed to get us to sort of, to sort of react as opposed to think. Um, part of this is also related to sort of human nature. It's what we call rumor theory. So one of the things about being human is about storytelling and sharing stories. Like we are very social people. Storytelling has always been part of being human. Um, storytelling is as how we interact with each other. When we see people we haven't seen in a long time, we tell stories about things that have been happening in our lives. But part of that goes back to this sense of us needing to be able to make sense of the world. If, if there's something we don't understand, if there's something that we're, we're confused about or curious about, we want to learn more to try to understand it better and we want to share information with each other. So if you think back to, you know, in the earliest, you know, early human history, our earliest myths and legends were based off of trying to understand things like natural phenomena, like where does the sun go at the end of the day? Why, you know, what are those lights in the sky? You know, so many stories came from this idea of shared sense making. We should we put the pieces together. Um, and we try to create a story together to try to come to a, a common understanding. And social media actually um, amplifies that in the sense that we already, we already feel compelled to share things with, with others. Social media taps into that and makes us want to share it even more. And it also um, amplifies it in the sense that we can share anything with everyone at this point. So a couple of things to look out for if you are, if you are active on social media, if you, if you see things, there are some red flag phrases to look out for because these are things that are designed to uh, uh, sort of amplify our emotions and help to help spread misinformation, right? Um, so some of these things are like, you know, make this go viral. This it's, you know, you want to be part of this. Like this is something that we're all sharing. Like there's a big group of us that are doing this. It's a little, kind of a bandwagon effect. Um, being sort of in on something that not a lot of people know about, right? So like, like the media won't report this is suggesting that like I'm telling you something that is like not a lot of people know so you're learning something unique um, and so these ideas that people are hiding the truth from you um, and that there's some sort of you know sinister intent behind it so these are some red flag phrases to look out for because when, when people are saying things like this they're trying to get you to share something without really thinking about it um, and an important thing to to 
to sort of reinforce in this conversation about emotion is that before you share something, you should try to learn some context um, because you'll often have an, a reaction to something and what you're reacting to is often a very short piece of information. You, maybe you're reacting to a headline, maybe you're reacting to an image that you see, or you're reacting to like the content of a tweet or a Facebook post, but you're reacting to something that only has a very limited amount of information. It's important for us to, to always remember that context matters and we wanna learn as much as we can before we share something. And here's an example of this that actually popped up on my social media feed about a month ago. So this person tweeted out this, uh, this was an ad from a dental practice and you can see uh, you can see why this would be problematic, right? Everyone smiles in the same language using this, these ethnic, uh, you know, cultural costumes. You know, part of it actually says no matter your accent or origin. Um, and so this person, you know, tweeted this out and you can imagine the outrage it generated. People were really angry. They were commenting on it. They were sharing it. Um, so this, I saw this a month ago, right? I was curious about it. And I, I did a quick Google search and I found out that this actually is an old story. It's from May of 2018. Um, it's a real ad and this dental practice put it out and it created a firestorm. People were upset. You know, there's accusations of cultural appropriation but the dental practice apologized for it. And so the problem though, is that people were generating this fresh outrage for something that's almost three years old and the, 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 the people responsible for it have actually taken responsibility for it. They apologized for it. And you know they have taken steps to make sure that doesn't happen again. But by sharing something in this and creating this fresh outrage, right, we're, it's, it's, we're, we're jumping on this bandwagon without really understanding what we're reacting to. And so understanding context is really important. So yeah, that it's, that's an, you know, an insulting, offensive ad. And I had that reaction, but it's also important to take a step back and look. Um, also, when we talk about this, um, in addition to learning context, we want to apply a little bit of logic checking. Like, right? does this make sense? So here's an example from uh, one of the common conspiracy theories about COVID-19. Um, people are claiming that somehow 5G networks are spreading COVID-19. Um, so if you look at this, right? Um, so one map is uh, a map of 5G networks. Um, that's the top one. The bottom map is a, is a hotspot map of uh, COVID-19 outbreaks. And you can see the similarity between the two of them, right? And so when people are sharing this, they want you to believe that this is proof that COVID-19 is being spread by 5G networks, right? But you know, the old, you know, one of the oldest rules, correlation does not equal causation. So we want to take a step back and just and, and do a little logic. Does it make sense? Um, another example of this uh, is we see a lot of this with you know, cause and effect, especially with like medical misinformation. Here, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, shared this website claiming that when Hank Aaron died, he had died because of the vaccine, right? Yes, Hank Aaron got the vaccine and he died a little over two weeks later, right? But his cause of death had nothing to do with the, with the vaccine. But in this case, Robert Kennedy is trying to is trying to make make us more afraid of the vaccine because he is he is one of the, the biggest spreaders of vaccine misinformation, right? And he wants us to be fearful of it and to believe that somehow Hank Aaron died because of it. Here's just one more example I'll show you, right? So this is we see this in a lot of politics. So this was a there's been this weird conspiracy theory that somehow. Um, because Joe Biden hadn't flown on Air Force One, he wasn't the legitimate president. And he took a trip to Delaware on the, the aircraft that's on the bottom. And so people are saying like, look, that's not Air Force One, right? But the, the reality is that Air Force One isn't an aircraft. Uh, Air Force One is what they call any aircraft that the president is flying on. It doesn't matter what the aircraft is. If the president's on board, that is the aircraft that's called Air Force One. So just trying to apply a little bit of logic checking um, before you share something, you know, just, just give it a little sniff test. It doesn't make sense. So I'll pause it one more time here before I kind of get into the last little bit about debunking to see if there are some, uh, some questions. Let me pop in. So, um, there are a few questions oh. in the chat that I can read off. Sure. 
So here we go. Um, well, um, sorry, there's a few messages as well. So um, someone asked, um, what is the most frequently used of the five? Um, so I think it, it, I think it, what is most common um, that I, I would say it's probably, it's probably a close, close tie between manipulated content, people, you know, Photoshopping images and taking things out of context. So false context and manipulated content are, are by far the most common of, of the five. I don't know that, I don't know that I can sort of say for certain one is, is more common than the other, but they are both ex exceptionally common. Um, and by the way, I, I'm noticing that a lot of people are asking for a PDF of the presentation. Yeah, I will, I'm, um, I'm going to send a, um, a copy of the, the PDF of the slides to, to Senior Planet and they'll, they'll make sure it gets out to everybody. Another question that was asked, and I know it was answered in the chat, but just in case people have, don't see it, um, please describe the difference between mis and disinformation. Sure. So disinformation is a type of misinformation. Um, and what disinformation is, it is false information that has been deliberately created and intentionally shared to sort of manipulate people into believing something is true. So disinformation most often comes from like governments and organizations, right? People create this false information because they are trying to deceive us into believing something is true. Misinformation is the much broader category that is sort of anything that is false or misleading can be considered misinformation. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat, but there is someone who has their hand raised. So um, I will lower your hand and just unmute you for the moment. Um, and you're good to go, Jim. Uh, my question was, uh, earlier in your talk, you listed the categories of misinformation and problems to consider. And one of them was uh, uh, fighting or discrediting democracy mm -hmm. as a form of, of government. Uh, is, is that primarily by uh, extremist organizations? I mean, I, I'm, we're all raised in a democracy and in our lives, our, our ancestors were mostly in a democracy. It's worked well for America. It's the envy of a lot of countries. I don't, uh, can you help identify some of the sources of people who purposely try to down play or mm -hmm. uh, devalue uh, our de democratic system? Is this just Russia or other well, countries or? So it's, so the, the thing is that it's, it's not, a lot of it isn't specifically designed to undermine uh, democracy itself. Um, one of the things that we have seen in the last several months in particular is a lot of misinformation and even conspiracy theories about the election. So um, there are there are you know there are individuals, uh, there are some different types of groups, fringe groups that are spreading these uh, in particular conspiracy theories about the voting systems. Um, about the, you know, suggesting that somehow um, uh, votes were changed either through electronic means or through some sort of other fraud. Um, you have accusations that, you know, thousands upon thousands of people who were not eligible to vote were, had voted, people who were dead had voted. Um, and the thing is, is that all of the, all of that misinformation what is, is being so people a lot of people genuinely believe it right but what that is what those have been trying to do is to make people believe that somehow this was not a legitimate election that somehow um president uh, former president trump actually won the election and, and uh president biden lost and one of the effects of that one of the one of the results is that if people believe that this election was fraudulent, that if this, this election had been manipulated, 
then maybe we can't trust any election. And, and that's, that's the, 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 the longer term effect is that the more people who believe that this election was fraudulent, right? We saw, so we actually saw it in the, the runoff in Georgia um, when, when we had the two runoff elections for the, the two Senate seats in Georgia, a lot of the misinformation about the, 20, the presidential election carried over to where people said, well, if this is a fraudulent election, I'm not gonna vote. Um, and so a lot of people in Georgia stayed home. Um, and th so there was a lot of distrust that resulted in that. John, if we go back to 2016, a lot of that was coming from outside uh, governments. You know, th there was a lot of disinformation coming from Russia that was undermining the election in a lot of important ways. So some of it's foreign, some of it's domestic, um, but it's designed, it is, it is designed to make us not trust the system, which then has the effect of, of destroying our faith in, in the democratic processes. John, if I might add, uh, that's a good reply, but uh, uh, at the same time that was going on, there were court cases, you know, 60 or 70 court cases, uh, as far as I know, all of which were thrown out of court with no basis. Mm -hmm. And that was in the media. All those same people that were influenced in a negative way, I don't understand why they weren't influenced by all of the courts mm -hmm. everywhere throwing that complaint out, which to me discredited that complaint time and time again. So uh, maybe it's people that don't watch the news. They just hear something by the grapevine by somebody else That's... and they don't get that. Yeah, Jim, that's a really important point um, because you know the the court cases and all these things were widely widely reported across news organizations. Um, the problem is that this is this is where we get into, and we I talked about this a little bit last month. But the more someone has a belief, right? So the deeper somebody believes in something. So using going down the same path, someone who is a very deep supporter of former President Trump, um, believes that he should have won the election, um, they will start to believe anything that supports this idea that the election was stolen because, because they buy into that misinformation. The misinformation manipulates their emotions into believing it's true. The more they believe it, then they will start engaging in what's called motivated reasoning, which is, I believe this, so I'm gonna go find anything that will actually reinforce that belief, whether or not it's true. So they will go to other sources of information. They'll go to other social media networks, hyper-partisan websites, right? Anything that will reinforce this belief that the election was stolen. And no amount of sort of neutral, rational, verified information is gonna sway that because the, the, the harder somebody holds onto a belief you know, the more that it's sort of tied to who they are, the harder it is to get them to, to recognize something. And so it's, it's very difficult because there are so many voices and so much noise confusing things that it's really hard for us to sort of cut through it to get at the factual information. So that's the, I mean, that's the thing is in the end, this misinformation has manipulated so many of us on an emotional level that we can't quite break through that. I have a question. Sure. Uh why is it so much more predominant now than in the past? I don't remember this being such um, an issue years ago, but yeah. now it seems like everyone is disputing anything that's said. Yes. So um, there's a couple. There's a couple parts to that. So the internet and social media are certainly part of that that equation in the sense that. In the early years of the internet, the content that was online was, was things that was created professionally. Um, internet 2.0, which has been around for some time, gave us the power to be creators, right? So now anyone can create a website, can publish content to the internet, anyone can put things on social media, right? So there's, there's, so this is, it's really this, the sense that anyone and everyone can share things. Part of it though is also the importance of us being connected to people who share our beliefs, right? So if you think about it, most of us live in communities 
um, where there are like-minded people. Um, some of us live in communities where we are connected to people who share our same uh, cultural or ethnic background. Um, maybe we live in a community that's you know, centered around um, a particular church or other house of worship. Social media and the internet have actually enabled us to have much larger communities and we can be more connected to more people who share those beliefs. And what that does is it creates an echo chamber in the sense that when people get into these online communities that are based on you know, political belief in particular, all, everything that's being shared is just reinforcing what the group believes. And ideas that challenge that belief never get introduced or are, are, are sort of suppressed. So yes, we have a much larger global community. We can be connected to anyone and everyone. But part of that is also the sense that we sort of keep our networks close and we don't often get exposed to people who have um, opposing viewpoints. Thank you. You're welcome. For the purpose of time, um, unless um, John, there, there's not too much left to go over, um, we'll hold off on conversations for- Yeah, let me, let me, there's one last little piece I wanna, I wanna mention. It's like, how do we push back against misinformation? Right. Um, and then I will, I'd be happy to stay on for as long as people like to try to answer questions and, um, and, and talk about this. Cause I feel, I feel like a lot of people want to talk. And so I'd like to make sure we have that time. Um, okay. okay. So how do we push back against misinformation if we see it, right? People are sharing it. Um, so I just want to mention a couple things really quickly. We, first, we want to be able to verify whether or not something is true. Um, and we want, to, we want to create a situation where we're having a conversation about misinformation, where we're having a conversation about something, but we're doing it in a way that gets people to look at things for themselves. We don't want to, we don't want to just sort of say, you know, that's wrong. So I'm going to walk through this. The idea is that we want, to, we want to turn this into a conversation. We want to talk about misinformation and understanding things together. So the first thing we want to do is we want to fact check. So I'm going to use this example. Uh, so this was from uh, back in uh, December, I believe. Someone had photoshopped this image of uh, former Vice President Biden uh, to suggest that he was wearing his walking boot on the wrong foot after he had uh, injured his ankle. So the images on the right uh, in the blue suit, that's an authentic image, right? That's, that's the actual leg. The image on the left is actually from a couple is actually from a couple of years ago. The boot and the mask have been photoshopped, so this is manipulated content, right? So we can use some of our fact checking skills. We'll talk a bit more about this in the next session in March, right? We want to use some tools to verify something. We want to find uh, evidence that can show uh, why something is false. We want to try to get it from multiple sources. Finding original content is always good. So once we have the evidence, then we can try to find a way to sort of say, hey, um, let's talk about that thing you just shared, right? So we're gonna try to do this in a very thoughtful way. What we wanna avoid is called the backfire effect. What that means is that it, when our beliefs are challenged, we get defensive. And in that defensiveness, the backfire effect actually can make us hold on to a belief more because that belief is being challenged. So we want to avoid confrontation. We want to avoid anything like name calling. We don't want to lecture them, right? We don't want to, we don't want to suggest that they're, that, you know, we don't want to mock them in any way. We want to show empathy, especially from the sense that we have to recognize that this is something that this person believes is true. We want to validate what they believe, but then we want to pivot and share the evidence and talk about it. Um, but we also have to be willing to sort of step back in the event that things might get confrontational. So here's an example of how not to do this, right? So in that original, in that original Facebook post, people were trying, were being confrontational. They were, there was name calling, right? Um, and, and this is not a way to do this, right? Because this is just, this is counterproductive. And so when people were doing this, right, it, it then turns into a name calling and it's, and, and you can see it has, it, it's actually nothing to do with the original image. Um, here's, an, here's another one, right? And so when people do that, it just turns into a back and forth. Well, you, I mean, we're not fake, you're fake. And it, it's a pointless conversation. So here's a couple of examples of how I might approach this, right? 
um, I would express my skepticism, right? So I would say, hey, I'm skeptical. It looks like it might be Photoshopped. I found a different version of the picture that it's, it's different. Um, what do you think? So I'm expressing skepticism, but then I'm, I'm just showing them why I'm skeptical and I'm asking them to evaluate it for themselves. So by doing that, it's, it's, it's not saying, hey, I can't believe you shared that fake image. It's like, I, I, have, I have questions, here's what I found. And it's using this questioning to sort of open up a conversation. Um, another way, if this is, especially if this, you're talking about someone that you know, is referencing someone that you both know, uh, uh, you know, another acquaintance, especially somebody who, you know, is someone that you both sort of like and respect, right? So I can say, hey, you know, Susanna shared a link to that. It was a fact check that says it's Photoshop and, you know, maybe, you know, I'm not quite so sure. And again, like, what do you think? It's this idea that you're, you're asking them to evaluate it. You're not telling them it's wrong. You're saying, I have questions. I'd like to know what you think, and hopefully they will be able to scrutinize it for themselves. Um, another way um, is, is with questioning is like, hey, where did you get that, right? And you can reference things like, you know, hey, there's so much fake information out there. There's so much misinformation. You know, people are trying to take advantage of us. Um, where'd you get this? And that asks, that sort of invites them to, to question their own sources. Um, and the thing is, is that it, it can work. So when I was when I was looking at this example, so on the on A, um, I took this screenshot on December fourth. It had been shared six hundred and twenty four times. Um, four days later, I took another screenshot of it, and the number of shares had actually dropped, which indicates that people may have unshared it on Facebook. So after it was called into question, some people actually you know took it back. They didn't they they didn't want to share it anymore. So there there is there is some evidence that it can work. But also, it doesn't always work because people will share a fact check, um, and then you can see people saying, "Hey, you know, clearly it's 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 true." Um, so I always emphasize what we call PEP when we want to talk to people about things that are fake. When we talk about misinformation, we want to be patient, right? This isn't a, these are not often conversations that will resolve themselves in with just one talk, right? When people have a strong belief and they believe something that is false. It's going to take time to get them out of it. We want to be empathetic to their beliefs, to the fact that they were most likely manipulated into believing something and they have an emotional connection to it and we want to help them out of it. And especially if this is somebody that's important to us, we want to be persistent and we want to make sure that we are trying to make sure that people are, are, are recognizing when they believe something is false. And part of that is, is just one of the things that I want to emphasize is just the importance of modeling. You know, in education, modeling is always one of the most powerful educational tools that we have. You can be a good model for this. You can help stand up for it by practicing some of these things, right? To check, you know, learn some context, do a check, check the logic and being very careful of what you share uh, because we don't want things like beliefs uh, to become facts. Um, so I'm going to uh, pause here for questions. Um, I'll actually stop sharing my screen so I can see more faces. Um, and let's let's chat. What do we got? So there's a few people who have their hands up. Um, I've seen these up for a bit, so I'll go to these first. Um, first is Bill. I'm going to lower your hand, Bill, and unmute you. Okay. Hi, Bill. Thank you. Uh, I was uh, also uh, concerned about what uh, I'll reference it, uh, so I think it'll be better understood. In the 1916, uh, uh, 2016 election, um, Trump was accused of, of uh, collaborating with uh, uh, Russia, first one thing or another, and this led on for several years. And this, uh, uh, this was very difficult to determine what was wrong and what was wrong or not right, or what was true and what was not true. And it really wasn't until years later, we'll say, well, really around 20, what, uh, 2020, that uh, it all came out. Hey, it was all a bunch of false information. So, how do you com combat that? Now then, I realized you can take and go fact check it, uh, fact check it at these different places, 
and they were and some of these uh, companies were doing it. Uh, Fox News, I know, and Hannity was doing it uh, all along, and they were giving their references, and yet CNN would not go over and reference it, uh, mm -hmm. which I, I found rather discouraging. Uh, I also, uh, you take uh, in, um, uh, what's his name's book? Uh, the, the, oh my, I'm, I'm getting too old for this here. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, the FBI uh, our guy that uh, was investigating all of this here uh, mm -hmm. uh, with Trump Call there. Comey, that's it. And he wrote his book. I don't know how many of you read it. I read about half of it, and and and, and it it was a it was a well written book and mm -hmm. so forth like this here. But as he said, he said he didn't prove or he didn't disprove it. All right. right. So you know uh, how do you and and he wasted all of that time and money when he should have been able to handle it in such a, a much shorter time. And, right. Uh, this is ridiculous. Uh, the information that is out there that is false. Mm -hmm. Now then, we're, uh, as you mentioned before, and I, I and I'd like to elaborate on that. Sure. But you mentioned about the uh, false information about the uh, election. Uh, that some of us say it was uh, the information was manipulated, or the uh, votes were manipulated, and so forth. But we really, I think we're, that's going to be one of those things that's not going to be proved or disproved really for years down the right. road. And I, I, I kind of questioned you, or I did uh, myself, was, was you giving false information at that time there because you presented it as fact? Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm not chastising you. I appreciated your lecture very much. Okay, thank you. Um, so there, there's two parts that I, I just want to sort of speak to in that. So the first part with the 2016 election, um, we know there was Russian interference in our election. A lot of the disinformation, a lot of the things that were spreading across social media in the 2016 election did come from Russia and other outside organizations, right? There, there is, there's deep evidence that shows that. What, was, what hasn't been proven, and you know, when we talk about Comey's book, the Mueller report and a number of other things, um, which is, is actually a somewhat of a separate issue is whether or not that was coordinated with President Trump's campaign. Um, so that's, so it's almost, so it's kind of two different issues in the sense that what happens though is that people sort of latch on to one part and then it sort of don't go into the details on the other. So that, so yeah, you're right. We may never know for sure whether or not there was coordination or collaboration between the campaign and, and the Russian disinformation. There's, there's no definitive evidence from at least from what I've seen, there's, you know, there's a lot of sort of anecdotal things, but, and still a lot of accusations, but um, the other part of that, and, and you mentioned um, Sean Hannity in particular, one of the things that we have to be cautious of is if we, is, is where we are sort of getting information from. So if we think about like Sean Hannity or Rachel Maddow or a number of those uh, sort of talking heads, a lot of what they are sharing with us is commentary. And often when we're talking about commentary and opinion, they're using cherry picked details and evidence because they're trying to support a particular viewpoint. And so the thing is, is like, if we're looking at, this is where we have to remember the difference between news and opinion, because we have things, you know, news organizations are reporting on the details. Um, and then we have people who are telling us their opinions and what, what they think about it. And that's very difficult because that really confuses things um, because the, the, co the commentators, the opinion people, you know, they're not trying to inform us. They're trying to persuade us to believe a certain thing. And that actually makes things a lot more confusing because there's a lot more commentary out there than there is news, especially when we talk about the national news networks. Um, so that, that's, it's very problematic in that way because there's so, there are so many different types of voices that are confusing things. Um, so that's, that's where things do get tricky, but trying to understand when we're being informed 
when someone's trying to persuade us and then when somebody is trying to manipulate us. Um, that's three, you know, one is news and you know, verified information. One is opinion where they're trying to trying to get us to come around to a certain point of point of view. The third is where they're trying to get us to believe something that's not true. And so that's that's where we're trying to get to. So I hope that answers your, your question, Bill. Thanks. Once again, thank you everyone for attending today's program and thank you News Literacy Project. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to seeing everybody next month.